not an option because we can't make it work. And we're going to talk about the reasons that we can't. And so you will see that red color in some subsequent slides. And that's what's very important for you to pay attention to because uh, I had, had, I've been mentioning for the last couple of months that I didn't think it was possible to close um, Central in its entirety for this coming school year. But I want you to see tonight, if we went down that path, what that would look like. And I think you, you will end up agreeing with that conclusion, but we'll see. Another option is to focus on the fall of 2013. And the discussion that we've had with the board up to this point is not that we would begin transitioning to close it then, but that we would close the entire building for use as a middle school. Not that the district wouldn't use the building for other purposes. I need to be, um, have absolute clarity about that because what we've talked about up to this point is still trying to minimally heat the building, takes the edge off and some of the cost off the utilities for that building, but continue to use the auditorium for all the purposes that we do for our music programs, our drama programs, um, et cetera. So again, if you look at the closing central scenario on the left, um, you can see the options in column two and three that we just talked about. And uh, here's what it would mean for next year. And I'm working off the fall 2012. So I'm working in the top right quadrant of the decision-making tree here. Even if we keep grades 6th, 7th, and 8th grade um, at Central uh, this coming school year, we're probably looking at an additional staff member of 0.8, which would be roughly $80,000. We've taken a salary. We have added a percent on top of that to cover full benefits. So it's what we call total cost compensation of $100,000 per teacher. And, of course, 8 tenths of that would be 80%. Why would we have that? Because an option, if you keep it open, is to still allow the school of choice practice that we've historically had here to operate. And we think if the board were to choose to close that building the following fall in 2013, you would have some, not everybody, it's very difficult to determine, who would choose the school of choice themselves out of that building this fall. And that would create staffing inefficiencies, which we think would amount to an additional little bit less than a, a full-time uh, teacher to staff those students that are left. You have low sections, uh, low section sizes. You have special education that feeds into this, as we're about to see. If you keep just grades seventh and eighth grade uh, at Central next year, we think that will be an additional cost of the district of $388,000. And that's a combination of the staff that would be required to make this happen uh, and busing costs. And we'll get into the detail of where, uh, what that $388,000 comes from as we go through the PowerPoint here. Again, if we close it as a middle school, um, uh, we believe the additional cost would be $298,000, mostly for moving modulars and busing from busing um, uh, all three grade levels of students um, at Central. Uh, the reason that's in red is we don't think that we can come up with a schedule actually to accommodate that. You're going to see that our sections uh, capacity in the two remaining middle schools is going to be 99.5 percent. When you have that much pressure on using classrooms, you have to have a perfect schedule. And I've been doing this for 24 years now, and I've never seen a perfect schedule. So the, uh, we're just too tight, we believe, to make that happen. So there's unrealistic use of space. There is no room for modulars um, at Jefferson. We just found out today that different than where the modulars are that we have in the district now, they can't be located by building code. As close to the buildings as they historically have been, they have to be offset at least 30 feet back. And uh, there are two modulars at Northeast. We wouldn't have to change those. But if you look at where we would add modulars at Jefferson Middle School, it would require us to take some of those, um, most of those oak trees down that flank that campus, and that's going to be problematic for us. And that's what I mean by the unspecified building and ground prep. So there are costs associated with that that are not even included in the 298000 And then you can see if we look at the fall of 2013, uh, we think the additional cost would be $33,000 for busing. And we'll get into the detail of this, and you may have questions as we work our way through this. But I want to give you a highlight of what you can start looking at as we work through the details of each of the options, pointing out again that I just don't think we can make it happen to move all three grade levels um, by this fall. So in the fall of 2012, 
uh, keep all three grade, level, grade levels at Central Middle School. If we anticipate a school of choice request like I reviewed with you earlier, we think we'd have to add some additional staff at Central to accommodate those students that would be left. What if you looked at the option for next fall of moving sixth grade out and just keeping seventh and eighth graders there? We would anticipate that we would have a need uh, for uh, 2.0 sta additional staff members, plus or minus, either way, uh, in order to make this happen. It would potentially add another staff person uh, in the area of special education. There are quite a number of our sixth grade students at Central that qualify for learning disability services. And we think if we move those students over to the other two middle schools, it would re require an additional staff member to accommodate them. And then uh, again, under this scenario, transportation would add busing costs for sixth grade students. And the cost of that, I think we estimated to be $88,000, but that'll show up um, a little bit later here. If you look at um, all middle school students moving to Jefferson and Northeast, and this is the one that I don't believe we can make happen, um, we have some capacity limitations, and that's in the, the long column there, second from the right. The section capacity would be at 99.5%. And uh, we would need an additional computer lab at Northeast and Jefferson. Uh, if we go down this path, it would require flexible use of lunch and PE um, educational space at both Jefferson and Northeast. It would require seven additional special education classrooms and the transportation costs that I've alluded to. If you go up in the right-hand corner, you can see if we used all classrooms six hours a day which would mean that teachers at Jefferson would not have a classroom available for their conference and prep. I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, it drops our capacity to 82.2%. I would like you to envision, though, what that really means for teachers in the building. Um, we would have a lot more students in the building one year earlier than we thought we would, and that doesn't leave many places for teachers that are on their conference and prep to go to. It doesn't give them access to the resources that they need for conference and prep. And other than using the teacher lounge, which has some limited capacity for how many teachers could really be in there with their materials and planning, teachers probably would have to go to uh, the library, which is not an ideal place to be working on tests and doing your prep for classroom instruction. I'm not sure how to get that off the screen, Cindy, if you could help, that would be great. For 90% capacity, um, which would mean that our teachers would be able to use their um, classrooms, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mrs. Klein or Mr. Valendi, uh, would require 10 additional modular to be divided between Jefferson and Northeast. And that was something that we hadn't anticipated being quite that high. So that's embedded in, in, in the cost um, that we think makes it prohibitive to go down this path and move all three grade levels by this fall. We're going to circle back to this here in a minute. If we focus on the fall of 2013 and we move all middle school students um, out of CMS, there will still be a need for an additional computer lab. It would require still flexible use of lunch and our PE educational space, for example, at Jefferson. You may have to drop the screen, use both sides of the gym. We may have to get creative. We'll be tight on space, but we believe we can make it happen. If you drop down to that third blue box on the right-hand column, we would actually have 7.7% 7 .7 fewer, 153 middle school students in the fall of 2013 versus what we have currently in the building. So that takes some of the pressure off trying to um, uh, do it in the fall of 2013 versus this coming fall. We would still have the need for seven additional special education classrooms. Our section capacity would be at 93.8%, and transportation would have some added busing costs. The busing costs actually in this scenario, and we'll see this in a later slide, are actually less than what it would be if we had to uh, bus just our sixth graders next year, if we were to transition and move sixth grade only. And that's because we would be running essentially double bus runs for um, central middle school students. We'd be taking the 7th and 8th graders there, and on top of that, having the transportation costs, moving the 6th graders over to the other two middle schools. 
So added cost associated with the 2012 scenario. So you can look at the column up at the top, which is grades 6, 7, and 8 at the middle school. Um, no change other than the $80,000 for a new staff member. You can see grades 7 and 8. Again, the two additional staff persons, potentially adding uh, one more staff person for special education. Our transportation costs will be identified to be $88,000. You can see the uh, two staff members would be 200000 and then the special ed staff would be 100000 And then um, I won't repeat all this on the red slides again. You can see our capacity limited if we moved all Jefferson, um, I'm sorry, all CMS students uh, this coming fall. We have capacity limitations that we talked about, 99.5%. We have transportation costs. Uh, we would have to use all classrooms six hours a day. Uh, to drop the capacity down to something that's more reasonable, I think, for teaching staff there. Uh, for 90% capacity, we'd have to move more modulars there than we had anticipated. And then what would we do? Because that would be a combination of new modulars we'd have to purchase or rent for a year. Um, if you move seven modulars, we believe that would cost $125,000. Uh, remember, there already is one modular at Northeast. Um, that's eight and um, we have two modulars elsewhere in the district that we think we could move. If we look at the fall of 2013, again, that's um, when we would move all middle school students under this option. Uh, you can see the additional need for computer labs, the flexible use of space, the fewer students in that fall versus now, the, the special ed classrooms. You see what the section capacity is, and you see the reduced cost uh, for transportation. Uh, anything with one star asterisk behind it, uh, it's capacity based on classrooms used only five hours a day versus the double star, which would be using them six periods a day. So closing scenarios on the added cost. This is the slide that you saw, I think the second or third one of the PowerPoint. If you look at the far right, um, just to keep making this point, if we keep things status quo, we've got an $80,000 increase in cost of the district. If we keep only 7th and 8th grade um, at Central next year, we believe the additional cost would be $388,000 beyond what we have this year for cost. If we close the middle school, um, we know the additional cost would be $300,000, but in all honesty, we cannot make that happen for you. We have challenged ourselves to say, you know, what, what would it take to make it happen? Even with the use of modulars, with no place to really put them, we don't see how that can be a, a reasonable recommendation uh, for us to make. And in the fall of 2013, you can see that the additional costs would be primarily just with uh, the busing. I want to remind you that when the Elementary Building Closure Committee uh, looked at data, um, they identified a half a million dollars that was associated with Central Middle School. That included all, uh, eliminated the administrative costs, the support staff, uh, the building manager. The utilities for the last school year in that building were 160000 a year. We think we could mitigate about 40% of that um, once the building is closed um, with some, uh, some of our best thinking on the table right now. So there's really um, uh, $340,000 that you have to play with one way or the other depending on how you look at that. Are they, is it fewer savings? Is it really additional cost to the district? We think in terms of comparing next year's cost under these scenarios to this year, they are additional costs. If you take a look at the enrollment, this is just good to remind all of us, you know what, Linda's gone back and looked at enrollment all the way to last year's birth rates and uh, we're beginning to flatten out a little bit, um, just over 1,700. Um, but you can see the drop uh, from this fall, 2011 down to what we anticipate it being in 2013. This is anything but an exact number. Um, uh, it is just too hard to predict. And even when we talk about classroom use, part of what makes me so nervous when I look at our, our capacities getting so high is that we have had turns um, in our capacities as much as 10%. Linda, you want to use your line you used with me earlier today? on the distribution of students because of course sixth graders aren't necessarily in classes with eighth graders and so we could have the very same enrollment for the three grades 
but depending on how they're distributed across those three grades, we could easily have at least a 10% swing in the number of sections that we need, which is why we don't feel comfortable with anything that drives the capacity up to 99.5% because we're just asking for the inability to schedule the students in the classrooms. So savings versus additional cost, if Central is closed as a middle school in the fall of 2013. And you can see what I'm leading to. Um, I think the most astute recommendation that I can make to you as your superintendent on behalf of our uh, administrative team here is to give a closing in the fall of 2013 a very serious look. It is the least expensive route um, in which you take. Uh, Non-instructional staff, uh, the savings would be just a little bit over 376000 You see the mitigation of the utilities off the 160000 uh, by sixty-four, And you see the 33000 The net savings realized would be $407,083 um, if we took this path. This is not an easy decision for you to make as a Board of Education. I know that. Um, um, if you keep all three grade levels at Central for one more year and uh, make a public statement that it's your intent to stop using it as a middle school in the fall of 2013, that puts our sixth graders in a very precarious position. And I know um, our finance study committee was very sensitive when we met for, um, I think it was just last week, uh, for a couple of hours. Um, that even if it meant some increased cost to the district to help with the transition, so that transition could be smooth and supportive, even if you did move sixth graders um, next year only and left seventh and eighth grade in the building, um, the finance committee, I think, looked upon that, that favorably. We just didn't know at that point in time that we'd be looking at three hundred and ninety-eight or three hundred and eighty-eight thousand uh, dollars to make that happen. That is uh, quite a chunk of change that we had not anticipated. So with that, um, I'll leave the screen down in case you want us to go back and ask questions or we can review the whole thing. But with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. President. Thank you. And thank you, Linda, for your input on that. Comments or questions of Mr. Ellinger? Hey, can I just ask sure. Mr. Verlinder and Mrs. Klein if there's something that they want to add because they've worked very hard on this along with me. And any critical point that we left out that you'd like to add, Gary or Linda? We go on a scenario where we have the classrooms are being used six hours a day. Um, the, the problem is not just that a teacher does not have access to their own classroom during their conference and prep period, but it means that 15 to 20 percent of that entire staff will have five classes in five different rooms throughout the day. As a former English teacher, I know that that can be a problem. If you're studying literature and you got all these books, you're going to have to move to five different classrooms to pick up those open classrooms that are available with the conference and prep. That's a large portion of the staff uh, to make that happen. And, and you would not see that issue the following year? We'll see some of it, but not to the level of 15 to 20 percent. If you could just take the two of you, I don't know if you have the exact numbers here, just start at the very high level, just kind of refresh all of our memories on today, what the enrollment numbers are for each three of the schools, and approximately what percentage capacity does that represent today? Just to kind of set the tone here. Do you know you have that handy? No. No? I'd have to go get it. Okay, that's right. I just thought maybe a rough idea what those were. Eight, nine hundred for each of the uh, two schools. Jefferson and Northeast are each in the eight to nine hundred range, right. and Central is below four hundred. Below four hundred, so less than half the other two schools. Exactly. Uh, Central has the smallest number of classrooms of the right. three, which is why that's the building that that we're even considering right. here, uh, that and age of the building. Uh, Central is probably at best 50% capacity. The other two buildings 70s, are probably at least in the 70s. In the 70s. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jeff. I, I had some questions about the, uh, the residents that go to the school. Um, what school would have the most residents compared to uh, which school would have the least as far as the, the residents that are in that area going to that school? Well, what I can tell you is working on an assumption that, uh, that 
we would use the district boundaries for Middle High and Dow High as they currently exist without changing right. or tweaking those. If you were to take um, the geography of where students are resident to each of the schools, right. um, if you use that, you'd be Jefferson at about 999 students okay. and Northeast 840. Okay. And Central would be noticeably below that? Well, I'm saying that if well, I we sent all the central yeah. to Northeast right. and Jefferson, just based on geography, now remember okay. the school of the choice consideration, okay, right. uh, et cetera, but yeah. just on the geography, we are able to track through our software that uh, 999 kids for next year would geographically be headed towards Jefferson based on the district boundary lines that exist currently for okay. Dow High and Midland High. Okay. And then out of the the scenarios of closing the other schools, the lowest capacity um, use of the school would be with central closing? You would have the, the school, you'd have some wiggle room, some space. That in leaves the, the most capacity. We looked at every combination of two buildings. Right. And I'm asking, yeah. Central Jefferson gives us the largest capacity if the two are combined. Uh, it's Jefferson Northeast, excuse me, okay, okay. Uh, Central because it has fewer classrooms. I believe the order is Northeast has the most classrooms, Jefferson is next, and then Central is behind that. I would also add that there are um, at Central classrooms that are smaller in size yes. that could, can only accommodate a special ed classroom um, and cannot accommodate a regular ed classroom as it gets towards a capacity of 30. Jerry. Um, to the, when we discussed at FFO, one of the big things that we talked about was the kids that just went through elementary transition and now they're going to go through a junior high transition and they go to another middle school transition and how do we avoid that and uh, the willingness for us to consider, I'll call it the economic pain of, of alleviating that situation for maybe what's 100 kids. Um, I see that price tag now is the delta price tag is going to be somewhere around $300,000 if we choose to go that route. Are there any savings to that scenario versus today? I know that's a delta from today. Are there any savings when we don't have sixth grade being staffed and we have added FTEs to mitigate some inefficiencies of the seventh and eighth grade? I'm trying to understand, are there no savings in that scenario also? Oh, we don't believe there are, Jerry. No. Unlike the elementary closures where we were spreading our enrollment over 12 buildings, mm -hmm. we're currently only spreading it across three right now. Okay. And that spread will drop to two, okay. but we're already, you know, we've experienced most of this the instructional staffing efficiencies already that the elementaries experienced. And even with the elementaries, it wasn't a huge number. Okay. And that's very consistent with yeah. your 2013 move. You're basically showing you the also, fixed cost, not the instructional cost being saved. So You also have to consider that the elementary schedule is very different than the secondary schedule. Mm -hmm. The auxiliaries can be moved around um, within that elementary schedule, it's not an hour by hour basis for an entire hour. At the um, secondary level, you've got um, five classes and six hours and an hour um, conference and prep in there. But you need to also consider that we do a lot of traveling between secondary buildings as opposed to the elementary buildings. We don't have teachers who are going to be half a uh, day necessarily, very few half day at one elementary going to another elementary. That's quite common in the secondary, and that's really where a lot of the inefficiencies come. If we were to go to a scenario with just the seventh and eighth grade, we would have four full-time teachers at Central. That would be there from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. Everybody else, auxiliaries and even core classes, would be traveling teachers. Now, the biggest problem is, is a lot of the auxiliaries um, because of the nature of the schedule and teachers needing time to travel between buildings during a conference and prep period, you tend to get all your auxiliaries that are traveling either at the very beginning of the day or the end of the day. The sad reality is when you look at the schedule, and Steve Poole and I uh, went over this uh, very carefully, is 
um, most of those traveling teachers, and now it's going to be all but four, um, are uh, travel at third or fourth hour in the middle of the day to accommodate two schools. Well, the problem is if everybody's traveling, are you going to have enough teachers to cover all the students you have third and fourth hour? And I can tell you without a doubt, based on that scenario, you're not going to have enough teachers uh, in the building at that time unless you're putting 50 in a classroom, which obviously we don't want to do. So then the answer is we need some part-time teachers or additional teachers to be put in at that third and fourth hour to offer some auxiliaries and the core classes as well. That's the biggest squeeze uh, under a 7-8 scenario. And part of what was shared with the Finance Committee is that could generate as many as 15 or more part-time staff members shared between the, the, the three middle schools. Right. If you leave 7th and 8th grade um, only uh, at Central for this coming year. You also need to consider this isn't just, this wouldn't just become a Central problem. This would impact the schools that those uh, people are traveling to as well. It'll affect most directly Jefferson and Northeast and their schedule. We're already seeing a little bit of that even before this. Um, and could even affect Midland High and Dow High because we have some people who travel between the high schools and the middle schools. Rick. Yeah, that's probably the, the biggest surprise for me here as well based on you know the early lengthy discussion with FFO which I know we didn't have all these numbers worked out then that we would incur such a high incremental cost by moving sixth graders to what we I guess erroneously, erroneously assumed would be a more efficient operation at the other two schools. If you go from moving just I don't know what is 150 kids I don't know what the number is for the sixth graders move them this year it costs us almost four hundred thousand dollars more if you wait one year and move everybody mm -hmm. it costs virtually no additional money with a one-year difference going from 150 to moving 400 or whatever the kids are that's kind of mind-boggling to me the the one question I have and I know we don't have a crystal ball and you kind of alluded to this is um, and you're right FO we had a lot of I think and Carl you did too we had a lot of concerns about the sixth graders moving twice two years in a row at a very you know sensitive fragile age quite frankly um, I'm trying to think what my train of thought was on that. There was, a, there was a big concern that we had, and then the other thing that we speculated with, if we didn't do that, what would schools of choice do by parents who had the opportunity to say, we want our sixth graders to go anyway somewhere else because we don't want them to experience that transition two years in a row. So that may still happen because we have to talk about schools of choice and what the capacity would be to do that. So the reality of it might be that we have a fair number of this year's fifth graders through schools of choice wanting to move on anyways, even though we're not going to move them on, on mass if that's the way we vote tonight, and the impact that would have on scheduling and incremental cost. And I know you don't have a crystal ball. You probably don't know the answers to that, but I'm just kind of throwing that out there as maybe a real-life possibility that I think we've expressed concern about where that sixth-grade class may shrink automatically through schools of choice process. Yeah, that may happen in the various scenarios that Steve Poole and I um, figured out and tried to take a look at that is our best guess is we'd probably lose a section over at Central in the sixth grade, but still we think that we can make that work. There will be some inefficiencies depending on those, how those numbers actually break. I mean, because um, sometimes the numbers fall. And they, you, can't, um, you, you can't cut a section because then it gets way too high, so you got to um, uh, okay a, a class of 21 as opposed to the ideal 25 to 30. Those things will fall. There will be some inefficiencies, but not to the extent of taking all the sixth grade. Is that what that 80,000 is? Mm -hmm. okay. You know, Rick, that's where uh, we're stuck on the same point because it's a risk to say, all right, we won't move the sixth graders next year and we just will live with the school of choice options. Um, We've had some discussion about um, if you allowed that, would you would you take that cost and cut it in half if you lost a large number of sixth and some seventh and eighth grade? Right. Um, I think Steve is less worried about this year's seventh graders bailing in the last year than he is the sixth graders. Is what I heard him say to us at yeah, the uh, right. finance committee meeting. Right. But even if there were just half as many sections this year as last year, I think it takes that cost um, down quite a bit versus moving all the sixth graders. Linda. Oh, I was just going to say, I appreciate this a lot because actually on, on my way home today, I was talking to my daughter and one of her friends and asking what their, as six, 17 and 18 year olds, what 
their opinion would be on moving six, seventh, eight, <coughs> and um, they had said, "Oh, mom, I I don't think I'd want to move twice in middle school." But seeing this, as you said, kind of puts a different spin on it um, because it is so costly. If you just if you move the sixth grade, and um, not that you want to put all the emphasis on cost because we care about how those those sixth graders and well all the students will transition, but um, I'm like you, Rick. That's that's a big number, and um, and <laughs> I was going to say. Um, so, and I know that I have true faith that we'll do it right. Whatever our decision will be to make sure these kids transition well. Um, just on it, I'm going to flip to another topic that Ms. Conrad brought up. Um, I don't remember what happens now with that. Uh, community center after school program because I know a few years ago there was uh, concern about how you get the, the middle school kids over there. Is there any kind of busing or has there been from Jefferson and Northeast to the community center or not? I, At this I don't point, believe so. No. I don't, I don't no. remember. So is that something we would be, uh, that's one question I'd written down, is that something we would be looking into? Well, it's not built into the cost. Um, it, um, so if that was something the board felt they wanted to do, it's going to raise that, that cost. You know, Lynn, I was thinking the very same thing. When you look at the, the uh, 2013 full shutdown and you sit there and see the added extra cost for busing because, mm -hmm. because it's all happening, it's cheaper than doing it half next year. And it might just be, and I don't know this, uh, I'd ask us to explore it, it might just be incremental that when buses come from there towards here, that routes go by the community center as a possible drop. And I don't know, you know, I'm speaking way out of school here because I have no idea what that means in terms of lots of other issues. But in general, it's directionally correct. It may add some minutes to some routing times, et cetera, but that inefficiency may not be incredibly expensive for us to do. And so I would highly encourage that whatever choice we make here, that by the 2013 year, we fully understand what that would cost us to deliver that option. We've got that wonderful facility sitting there. Um, we've got buses directionally coming this direction. It's easy to say that without looking at numbers. Um, we could always be surprised, but we ought to evaluate that would, what that would cost us and how the community center feel about all of that as we go forward. Well, and. Um before the comments this evening, and I, uh, Carl and I have talked about this issue uh, on in our meetings that we have um, about that very issue about students coming from Central to Northeast and to Jefferson to this transition, whether it be this fall or next fall. Um, the concerns were that we want to make sure that those students one feel welcome, and that the transition hope, hopefully is as uh, seam seamless as. A lot of our elementary experiences were, um, but the fact that uh, we haven't said it publicly doesn't mean that we haven't talked about it. And so, I think that that's a clear message to the community: is that it's not a it's not a given, but we certainly have the uh, have the interest in looking into those types of options for not just central students transitioning to other other buildings but potentially adding uh, something that would be a benefit to other students at both Northeast and, and, and Jefferson that could receive the same benefit. So, um, but those discussions have been going on for some time. Um, not all the discussions that go on with respect to um, this issue have been something we've publicly talked about here, and that's not to hide anything. It's certainly just a, uh, a concern that we have, and we do have a genuine concern about what this transition will mean to students um, both at Central and at, the, and at the current buildings at Northeast and Jefferson. So um, I, I don't want to make any guarantees, and I'm certainly not going to say it's a done deal, but just like Jerry said and uh, Lynn said, I think that's something we will have to look at and consider and uh, look at the costs associated with that. But uh, I, I think that uh, we have uh, some ideas as to potentially what that may look like. Can I just want to say, though, that Jerry made his con comments in the context of moving the whole school in the fall of 2013 because we already have a complex problem on our hands if you move sixth grade only next year. 
right. because that th that could increase uh, ridership. It obviously will. Um, it could increase uh, start times of uh, even Northeast Middle School, um, and it could increase routes. So I'm not. I think we have even less flexibility if you move one grade level to get kids back to the community center. On the tail end of the day, you wouldn't think that would be a problem. I mean, you're probably doing the rest of the route first because then the buses are coming back, but they're not that long. Uh, but it is different than walking next door for the child care. Uh, but I think it would be much easier for us to explore that and have it be much less costly if you move everybody in the fall of 2013. Well, and, and I'll take the lead on that discussion, um, and I think that any, you all can jump in. Um, this is my personal opinion as a, as, as a board member, not as board president, but as board member, that um, my uh, thoughts would be that uh, the entire transition should take place in 2013 and uh, without uh, anything happening in 2012. Uh, including moving any six incoming sixth graders, so the uh, entire move would occur in uh, the fall of 2013. That's my personal opinion on this and uh, position, and so uh, we'll open it up for Lynn. I would say the same thing, and, and I, with all the, the work and the research and the recommendation that Carl and, and this, his staff has made, and, and with what the uh, points that you've made on the, on the screen here, that. I would support that as well because I feel like we need to do it right. We need to do everything right, and we need that year to to, to do it right. Um, another point that Gary was talking about is with the staffing, and I know um, it, it's hard when teachers are going back and forth, and even my own kids have had that happen when they need to see a teacher and they're at another building and, and just trying to coordinate that, and I can't imagine it being more difficult than it is now. So I just think for, for all around good best practice for our kids and our staff, I would support waiting to fall of 2013. John? I would just want to add a point. Uh, this is going back to the building closures with uh, elementary uh, level, is that we needed a significant amount of computer crunching software computational time um, to look at the maps and the scenarios. Does the would that put less stress and pressure on our IT and our computer department to have more time, maybe to look at some of the community center um, possible um, partnerships continuing? And I, I don't that. really hear much that's part of that discussion that has me worried about IS. How about you and in the Linda? scenario of closing the year after next? Yes. Yeah, the boundaries and things, but more time would probably be better. Right, um, and we can also address. Um, the tweaking of the boundaries if that is necessary as opposed to just uh, going in with the assumption that it has to be exactly what it is right now between Gal High and Midland High. But there are a couple of neighborhoods that have traditionally veered from that path with schools of choice. Uh, there is some imbalance geographically between the two schools. We might be able to do some tweaking based on the actual population and the trends of uh, schools of choice uh, over the course of the next year. And also bus routes, more time for that too, and maybe there can be some continued partnership and creativity, more time to get down from the basics and work on some of the creative parts. Right. And I, I guess I would point to the fact that although it was stressful for everybody in this community and our staff and our students when we uh, closed elementary schools, um, we got very few complaints after that first day of school that next fall because I believe our staff had the time to plan ahead for that and look at every scenario so that on the first day of school, when those kids came into those schools that had been combined, et cetera, um, they felt comfortable, everything was ready, and the instruction could begin, and it did. Going back to the transportation concern, while we're talking about fewer buildings, we have to keep in mind that the middle schools don't represent standalone bus runs the way elementary schools did, and that our high school students and our middle school students ride the buses together, and so those routes have to be coordinated. And then because they occur uh, prior to the elementary runs, that we have to look at the turnaround time between when those students are dropped off either at their school or at their home, there needs to be enough time to get those buses back to the elementary. So it is a little more complex, I think, on the transportation side than the 
the elementary issue was, and we certainly would appreciate more time to, to be able to look at that and, and make sure that everything was in place. Thank you. You know, one of the things that we have been wrestling with is how to have the least negative impact and the most positive impact on kids. I and mean, that's the, the number one thing here. And as we talked at FFO, let's, uh, let's roll out all our options. I intuitively feel, and based on many emails, that many parents would prefer their current fifth grader starting sixth grade at their, quote, long-term building. I've also seen many emails that are contrary to that, of give it another year, give it another year. So I'm having a hard time deciphering, to some degree, what, parent, what parents are telling us in terms of what's in the best interest of their kid and their situation. So I'm not entirely convinced it's all one way or all another that's going to be good for kids or good for kids. It's, some are going to be better served one way, some are going to be better served the other way. And trying to divine what that split is is going to be well nigh impossible. Um, maybe the best thing for all of our kids is to have a very organized transition in 2013. Yes, some of them may go through a second transition. For those who really don't want to do a second transition, there would be a school of choice potential to solve that problem for those people that are concerned about that issue with their kids. Uh, that creates other issues potentially, but it's, 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 it's there, it's a relief valve. So while I struggle on which option to pursue, I, I take 2012 off the table because of all the issues you've pointed out, Carl, and repeatedly the issues. I still wrestle between the sixth grade, I'll call it uh, forced exodus versus the sixth grade optional exodus in terms of what's best for the kids and, uh, and the price tag that comes with that. And uh, I won't declare my opinion yet because I'm still wrestling with it because this price tag was a little more than I expected it to be. If that was much, much less, I would probably be going that route. But that high, it makes me sit there with the tweeners and which way is this really balancing? So maybe I just go with the 2013. Angela. Well, I, I was just curious. If you go with 2013 and you leave it up to the parents for school of choice to make the decision, what, what is your point where if a certain number of parents elect to go sixth grade to the other two schools where it does not make sense to still have sixth grade at Central, even though we have voted to do that, there's got to be a point where it doesn't make sense anymore. And I'm just curious, what, what is that point? You know, how many kids actually parents have to? And because not only do you have the sixth graders, but you would probably then also have the trailing siblings, you know, other siblings who may currently be at Central going into seventh or eighth grade who their parents would say, no, we want both right. of them at the same. Well, and then we're going to have cases just on the other side, too. You're going to have a kid who's currently a seventh grader, going to be an eighth grader, wants to say and finish their career the last year at Central, but they have a fifth grader that's coming along mm -hmm. the sixth grade, it, that parent then probably would lean towards staying at Central for their uh, both kids, having them in the same building with all kinds of reasons, parent-teacher conferences, open houses, that type of thing. The hard part is, at the stage that we're at, we can't predict mm -hmm. what those schools of choice are going to be. Yeah, but if they do come in to a certain point, I don't know what date you will know this, but is, the, I mean, is that too late then? Is it like, whoops, you know, we're, we're going to incur all these costs anyway because 50% of the kids we thought were going to end up there are not going to end up there? Well, the schools of choice window closes March 15th, I believe it is. Okay. So after we look at those, we've got to, and there's some processing, we got to check uh, residences and all those types of things. Uh, but um, we'll have some feel for that. Um, before we go into staffing, um, and that should be end of March, early April, that we have real firm feel for that. In terms of timeline for us, I mean, um, we've been communicating with the board and the study committee that if we were going to make any changes, i.e. move sixth grade next year, really tonight was the drop dead um, date for that mm -hmm. um, because we're going out and we're, I mean, they're already doing building orientations and so on for the for the middle schools 
for me, it's not easy to identify that number that you want. I mean, if you move sixth grade, there are some built-in uh, inefficiencies one way or the other. We've identified new costs. If you keep too small of a number, uh, Steve shared with the Finance Subcommittee, even if you only had, I think he said two sections, uh, they can make that work um, in terms of giving kids a good curricular experience, making sure that their education does not suffer in any respect compared to the other two grade levels. For my mind, when you look at 398000 what number are you comfortable with as a board? If that number were half that, is it worth investing that number? I mean, if you can give us a target, then as we see School of Choice coming in, we know some parameters budgetarily that we can be guided by. Go ahead. I think like it's been said by a couple of the board members, my biggest sensitivity with all this is the sixth graders, and it and has been. I think early on you kind of, you know, um, presented the, the case about how difficult it would be to, to move this fall, even though I think some of us and some parents have kind of um, give us that sentiment as well in the past. So let's just get it over with and move because all this uncertainty out there, let's, let's, let's just do it. Um, I think, you know, and, and, and Steve, I think, did a really nice job when we met with him to talk about it's about educational opportunities, educational value for the sixth graders. We want to do what is ideally optimize the opportunities that, that they have, whether it be at Central next year or whether it be at Jefferson or Northeast. My, my fear, I guess, but I, my, I, I trust in all of your judgment, and especially Steve and his team there, is that regardless of how many parents would choose and had the wherewithal to exercise schools of choice, because we talked about that very sensitively. We're talking about transportation here. If you exercise schools of choice, you have to have the wherewithal to provide transportation. If we move the sixth graders, we're providing the transportation. So let's just kind of be open about that. So if those parents who had the wherewithal and interest to schools have traced their kids to another school, so when we had capacity there, you know, for that remaining group of people, whether it be 150, 175, 50, whatever it might be, that might be left in the sixth grade, as long as we can assure that they will have the same educational opportunities and value that any other sixth grader in the district would have, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. I can't make that judgment from here. I have to trust the experts in the room to do that. So I'm very comfortable with, with shifting everything to 2013. We've been through that before. To me, it's the sixth graders, and I'm very surprised that these numbers turn out the way they did. But I trust them. I mean, I don't have any work on, nor is it my job to come up with different numbers to counter them. I'm just very surprised about how much incremental costs, not in reduced savings, but incremental costs we're incurring by holding up for a year. Yeah. Um, but I'm just concerned about whatever that number is, like Angela said, that would be left at central. I just want to make sure the sixth graders have the best opportunities available to them. And, and, and I'm comfortable if we can say that. Um, because I think, I think the schools of choice thing will affect that population of sixth graders. I, none of us can predict how many that is. I just want to know for whatever sixth graders are left at Central, so to speak, because their parents don't have the wherewithal or choose to or have the interest to move them, that they still have the same opportunities. That's, that's my biggest concern. Well, that's I, a prerequisite to me. Well, too. I think that going forward in the, uh, to help Carl and the agenda group and the, and the cabinet in general with this, with this issue is that at, if, in fact, we – depending on what we do here this evening, decide to go with the 2013 option, that we will monitor that issue very closely going forward and, and have a report back to the uh, board at some point in the future um, next uh, fall as to how uh, we're doing on that issue. But I don't, um, it's, it's a, if we all had a crystal ball, we could uh, probably have an answer for that question, but right now it's a, a very difficult one, so. And I'd, and I'd like to, to say something, too, for public consumption is, you know, the easy way to manage this would have been not manage it until 2013 as a board versus public airing, public discussion, and public thing, because that way you don't have this dichotomy of what you're dealing with. We could have made that a singular year issue knowing it was going forward, but we took the, we took the, the position of let's get it out there, let's hear comments, let's hear the public, let's understand that with the great risk that if we choose the later year or are forced to choose a later year, that that could create some anomalies for us. And that's what we're wrestling with because we chose to do that. Um, so it is what it is, and uh, we just have to make the tough call on how to manage it. But, Rick, I'm with you. My prerequisite is if we have a whole bunch of school of choice that happens and it ends up that the opportunities for the remaining sixth graders cannot be met, then it's new decision time at that point in time, as far as I'm concerned. 
well, it's, it, it may be too late in the process to change that decision. So when I hear you say that, what that means is put the cost into it to make sure those kids have an equal education. Correct. Correct. It's going to be we cost. We know the cost won't be 398000 Yes. Because we're not talking about all six graders. So, so it's going to be. So what I hope to hear so we can move forward is, I mean, we can't change this decision. You'll, you'll solve it with money. March or April. And so if we have a lot more um, parents at School of Choice, it just means we have to resource the building to assure that the quality yep. education is going to be there. I agree. And I don't think this district has a history any time of intentionally creating disparate education for uh, the children we serve, and it certainly would not be our intent to do that here or allow that to happen. Yeah, two points, Carl. Hey, I agree with you. It's, it's a money solution, not a revisit the decision, rechange the decision solution. Yeah. And number two, you're right. That this whole issue of closing central is a middle school is around the inability and the long-term inability with a small population to offer the opportunities we need to offer in an equitable fashion across the board. We've heard Kelly Buell come to the podium a number of times about move fast because he's concerned about potential eroding equity. And so I think we're all on that same page of, of yes, we're not going to let that happen. If we have to pay our way out of it. We'll pay our way out of it if we make this decision. I mean, we'll follow the same process for ensuring that equity that we have in the past because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know, for example, I think it's this year, Steve, um, or was it last year that you told us we offered German in Central? It's this current year. I mean, a lot of people out in the community think if you want to take a foreign language, um, you know, at Central, you have to take that either at one of the other middle schools or the high schools. And it just depends on how the schedule works. So following the same process that we've had to assure that equity of access, it may look a little different, but that equity of access, I think, has always been there. It impacts the building in other ways. When you start reducing the number of students, you know, can you run all the extracurriculars? And we've been particularly challenged by this uh, this year in the area of athletics. But um, and in music, it can impact music um, um, also. So I just don't want people to leave here hearing these comments saying, "Okay, now I've heard what I want to." So we're just going to dump a ton of staff in there. So right. we have no traveling teachers or. You know, we're going to run a section of orchestra with four kids in it for one grade level. That's not what I hear you saying. That's right. That's it's right. following the procedures that we've That's done right. in the past That's right. That's right. to have the equity be what it has been. Correct. Right. Now, we also had talked a little bit about the schools of choice scenarios and how we've handled that in the past and whether or not we're going to have capacity limits, if you will, because certainly if it's going to cost us $388,000 to move, I'm, I don't know if it's the right number. I keep using 150. Maybe it's the wrong number. All right, sixth graders. Then if we have 25, 50, 75 families, one of schools of choice, now all of a sudden we've got to determine how many can we handle at the other two schools because there's a cost associated with that as evidenced by this number. And we trust that you're going to have to figure that out because we just can't have a wide open whoever wants to go. And we may be very pleasantly surprised that only a very small number move. I don't want to keep painting the picture that it's going to be yeah. the opposite end. We don't know that kind of thing. But you may have to provide some kind of limitation. I, I'm assuming that you can't just open the floodgates if, in fact, the floodgates needed to be open. Is that? I think that's an accurate statement, statement. Gary and, and yes, but, um, remember, much of our schools of choice would be in sixth grade, and without moving the seventh and eighth grade over there, we've got some cushion as far as um, the space goes. But when you're talking long term, um, especially if, uh, if we ge geographically have a lot <coughs> going to Jefferson and that gets pinched, okay. Those from the central area um, can be offered schools of choice, but there are times, and this happens with our high schools uh, currently, if a particular grade level is closed, they can schools of choice <coughs> if there's space available. If there's space available. That's the point. You're going to determine what that space available yeah. is in so that it case. Could, it could be in a particular case that somebody from central, the schools of choice, wanting Jefferson, mm -hmm. and we can offer schools of choice but not at Jefferson, right. but can honor it at Northeast. Right, I understand. Which, okay. same as today. Okay, I think that uh, I, I thank everyone for their a very healthy discussion, um, and so I would call a question uh, of, of the board and. Uh, so can I frame the resolution and then modify it however you want, just so we cover adoption, because we've not officially had the board adopt a property management plan. Right. And in its recommended form in the section on Central Middle School, 
it would allude to um, ceasing to use Central Middle School as a middle school in the fall of 2013. That's how it's currently written. Mm -hmm. With that said, I move to adopt the property management plan as stated. Support. Moved by Mr. Wasserman, supported by Mr. Oley. Any further discussion or questions? Can I just clarify something? We haven't really talked about it at all since the first time presented, and, and I don't think we need a big deal here. But we're, we're adopting the plan. We're focused on some middle school. But in the plan, there was other things. There was a lot of <laughs> things. And, and the other things our plan were things we were not going to do. And I just right. wonder if we just need to reiterate, reiterate that, considering that there's been rumors bandied about for a couple of years about the future of two high schools and what have you. I just wondered if it's worthwhile for adopting the plan and embedded in that is no additional closing to elementary schools and for the foreseeable future and I don't want to put the five, eight, ten years, I forget what the number was, ten. that there is no active plans or consideration to do anything other than to maintain the two high, two high schools as we have them today. And maybe that's not the right wording, but I just thought I should get on the table to refresh everybody's memory on that. It yeah. is, and the plan also implies taking your current elementaries and continuing to operate them in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. I think the, the uh, plan stated like, uh, I can't remember if it was 17, 18, or 18, 19 uh, school year uh, mm -hmm. to operate them as um, K through fifth grade buildings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick. That, that's very much needed. That yeah. People know that's going to be our elementary approach. Mm -hmm. It's going to be our middle school approach. And that we don't see anything other than two high schools yeah, for I, at least that time period. I think the high school is really important. Because I mean, that rumor's out there it, all it over the place. It would be nice to uh, uh, stab the high school question the in rumor. the heart and say, yes. for the foreseeable future, yeah. based on that plan, yep. um, we're not making a recommendation that uh, we just can't see, given the student enrollment, and what we know is beginning to happen with economic development in the community that we'd be down to one high school yeah, in the sure. foreseeable future. Yeah. And I don't think, well, I'll just speak for myself. I don't see that happening in the foreseeable future for many, many years, but we also can't speak for future boards either. That's right. Exactly. And future right. superintendents. Right. So They can always change the plan. Right. Absolutely. So. They go a whole different structure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's one of the benefits of having a plan so that um, so parents can plan ahead. And, and overall for district wellness is so people can have an understanding of where things are going. Bringing the plan out now helps out, but also what it does do is it does, uh, with looking at the middle school option, it does bring up some uh, touchy issues, especially in the sixth grade. But I think overall, uh, for the district welfare, it's, it's better to have a plan and bring it out as soon as we have it. Very good. And, and that plan does take the full demographic trends that we can see today, the yeah. babies that are born today, in, into account of what's going to happen. Right. Uh, we don't know what babies are going to be born or not born in right. future years. That's why it makes it hard to say what's going to happen in 2025. Because don't know where you're Another at. Another phase of baby boomers. Who knows? Exactly. <laughs> anything? Anything? Well, not having been through this process before, of course, I'm learning a lot here. But um, everything that I hear, I feel really confident that the students' best interests are, you know, number one priority in what can be done and to ease their transition and what's the best way to do it. I feel really comfortable with what I've heard here. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we have a motion on the table with support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. You have your building plan. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Not an easy you guys did a wonderful thank job. You. Yeah, Just very good. And, and thank, nice thanks to everybody uh, at this table for their comments and, and uh, concerns. So Thanks for all the input from the public we've gotten over the last several weeks. Yeah. With that, we'll move on to, uh, in the agenda, to 4.4, the service consolidation plan, Mrs. Klein. Yes. Uh, this is an opportunity to bring some additional funds into the district. I know it's not usually the news that uh, you're used to hearing me bring, but uh, we have the opportunity under Section 22F of the current year's state school aid fund to qualify for a one-time incentive grant of $100 per pupil. With approximately 8,200 pupils times $100, this is $820,000 that we will be able to bring into the district. I want to emphasize that it is one-time money. Everything that we are hearing is that it's not likely to continue in its current form. The next State School Aid Act may have yet another form of incentive money, but it will be for a different set of incentives. But in order to be eligible for this, we have to provide evidence that we have met four of five what are considered to be best financial practices. These have nothing to do with academic outcomes or curricular or instructional outcomes. These are financial issues only. Uh, and the, the five are all employees who qualify for medical benefits contributing 10% of the cost of those. 
toward the cost of that package. Uh, developing a service consolidation plan, which we submit to the Michigan Department of Ed. That's what we'll be talking about this evening. Uh, putting a link on our website to the state educational dashboard. <coughs> Being the policy holder for our medical benefits and bidding at least one of our non-instructional services with a cost of more than $50,000. You may remember last summer, early fall, you passed a resolution indicating that you were indeed the policy holder, which was an easy one because of our self-insured status, and that we had bid non-instructional services. The Michigan Department of Ed is being very lenient on these, saying if you have done something in the last two or three, four years, we will count that toward your meeting of this. And certainly, you know that we bid our food service and we bid our custodial. And in each case, we ended up contracting out for those services. So those two we've already done. The next step is to develop a service consolidation plan. We can't go ahead and certify to Michigan Department of Ed that we meet all of these until we do that next step. And this is a process that was put in place two years ago when there was the first round of per pupil foundation cuts. And Michigan Department of Ed and the state legislature provided districts with some flexibility to say, if you want to be able to use some of your non-protected categorical money to offset these cuts, in other words, not use your at-risk money for at-risk, but to divert it to this other purpose. If you develop one of these plans, you can do that. Well, we never had the need to develop a plan because we didn't qualify for any of the non-protected categorical money, so it would not have done anything for us. So in tonight's resolution, you will be certifying to the Department of Ed that we will indeed develop this plan. And plan is, to some extent, a misnomer because really it's identifying to the Department of Ed initiatives that we already have underway, those that we plan to continue, indicating what it is that we've studied, uh, where we think we might look next. And then once we do this, we'll submit it to them and we'll be required to do an annual update to the Department of Ed. But that will allow us at the next board meeting to then go ahead and pass the full resolution saying we have met four of the five best practices. The one that we won't meet will be the 10% employee contribution because we currently have employees that are contributing in excess of 40% of the cost of their benefits, but we also have employees contributing zero toward the cost of their benefits. And that particular best practice is very, very specific in saying every employee with benefits must contribute 10%. Certainly wouldn't limit it to 10%, but it would mean that those who are currently contributing zero would have to contribute the 10. But we do know that with the service consolidation plan, uh, the dashboard, it's very easy for us to do. We're already the policy holder, and we've already bid our non-instructional service. And with that, we will be able to certify that we qualify for the money, and we would expect the first installment of it to appear on our March state aid report and then that money would be divided over the remaining state aid payments through August. So what you have is a resolution uh, indicating to the Department of Education that we intend to do this and then that will turn it over to us to actually create the plan and then bring back to you the certification for the best practices. So um, Lynn's first evening mm. as the official secretary of the board. Taking it easy on her. It's not a tax resolution. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too this bad. is very, uh, very it's short. A, it's, a good, it's a good breaking in <laughs> moment. So. She may not feel that same way. Are we ready? Okay, start right here. Yes, ma'am. Whereas MCL 388.1622 states <clears throat> from the appropriation in Section 11 there is allocated for 2011-12 only an amount not to exceed $154 million to provide incentive payments to districts that meet financial best practices under this section. The money allocated in this section represents a portion of the year-end state school aid fund balance for 2010-11. The amount of the incentive payment is an amount equal to $100 per pupil. A district shall receive an incentive payment under this section if the district satisfies at least four of the following requirements, <coughs> not later than June 1, 2012. And whereas one of those requirements related to service consolidation plans is found in 
MCL 388.1622 F1C. If a district did not enter into an agreement with the department to develop a service consolidation plan to reduce school operating costs under former section 11D as it was in effect for 2010-11, the district enters into an agreement with the department to develop a service consolidation plan that is in compliance with department guidelines described in subsection 2. And whereas the Midland Public Schools has been involved with service consolidation plans in the past, sharing various services, and whereas the district continues to pursue additional new opportunities for the consolidation of services, and whereas the Midland Public Schools intends to qualify for the $100 per pupil incentive funding for meeting financial best practices. Now, therefore, be it resolved that, one, the Midland Public Schools intends to enter into an agreement with the Michigan Department of Education to develop a new service consolidation <coughs> plan, and two, all resolutions and parts of resolutions insofar as they conflict with the provisions of this resolution are hereby rescinded. And that's a roll call vote after yes. the motion. So we need a motion to support. So move. Support. Moved by Mr. Ole, supported by Dr. Kaminsky, and we will take a roll call vote, Madam Secretary, on this issue. Okay. President Malt? Yes. Uh, Secretary Baker, yes. Uh, Mr. Wasserman? Yes. Mr. Ole? Yes. Ms. Branstad? Yes. Ms. Gorton? Yes. And Dr. Kaminsky? Yes. Any nays? You have your resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Can, you can, see can I ask one question? Sure. Is this one year money? Absolutely. Yep. Yes. So why? I knew the answer. Fact, I just want everybody else to hear the answer. Well, and, <laughs> so don't think about that in budget preparation. <laughs> in fact, uh, there has been some discussion, if you've been watching from Lansing, that this would not be a repeat uh, uh, in the future as far as what we can discern. Correct. So. I, I've heard a couple of different forms regarding <coughs> this. One is that after this year, it would not be additional money, but if we wanted to hang on to our full foundation, we would have to continue to meet these to, to not be penalized. So, in, yeah, a, sort of a <coughs> disincentive to backslide. Right. Uh, but the other that we're beginning to hear is that if there is additional monies next year, it'll take a different one-time form and may perhaps begin to address academic best practices right. instead of financial best practices. So I think this is just the beginning of incentive monies in lieu of foundation. So and tell us again, <laughs> roughly eight hundred thousand dollars. What? Yes. Eight hundred twenty thousand mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. year. About eight twenty. Successful. Yes. I I will plan to bring it to you in the budget adjustment at the next meeting, uh, along with the resolution indicating that we're going to comply with the four of the five. Thank you. And this one thing, how soon will we know for sure? So to make that a solid number in the budget, because I know we're trying to get these things done by June. But we're trying to get this. We're trying to give you all the tools that you need to, right. you know, dealing with the state, taking yeah. a while. This is actually 11-12 money. So we would, I, I would envision that we would hear from them. They, the MDE has been very open in if we send them the resolution that says we have met four of the five, they take us at our word. Okay. And Good. I would expect, Fairness. given the timing of our meeting relative to when state aid payments are made, we would see our first payment in March, which is why I would feel pretty comfortable putting it in the mid-year budget adjustment because if you certify that we as a district are meeting these practices, MDE isn't second-guessing that. And it takes one puzzle out of our budget coming into this next spring, so it's a There it's are some districts, Lindy, if you're going to do it, you have to apply by what, by June, June 1st? 1st. And, and so there will be some districts that make the request even in May. Yeah. Uh, our, our state aid is spread over the months October through August. So as, as late as June, MDE is able to deal with getting the request and making sure that the payments go out to the district for the 11-12 fiscal year. Very good. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you. And with that, do you have a CAS meeting, with Dr. Kaminsky? Yes. I have meeting minutes to read. You, there, there you go. Um, the curriculum and special services uh, study committee uh, committee mi uh, minutes is uh, here as follows. 
Uh, we met on Monday, January 16th at 1 p.m. Members present was myself, Lynn Baker, Carl Ellinger, Kathy Ellison, Yvonne Gordon, and Gary uh, Verlindy. Uh, the meeting location was the <coughs> community center, the post-secondary classroom. Uh, we discussed four topics. The first one was post-secondary class and program visit. Uh, the Curriculum and Special Services Study Committee visited the post-secondary program at the Midland Community Center. These special needs students ages 18 to 26 shared their experiences at the uh, various work sites in the communities and discussed their tasks and skills required to com successfully complete those tasks. Uh, teacher Lori Hedrick explained the curriculum of the program and the diversity of the students' needs. Um, and, and as the students explained that they were so enthusiastic, it was just wonderful to, to talk to the students and ask them questions. Uh, the second part was the educational programming for post-secondary students K through 12. Um, after the class visit, Bob Paris, uh, Cass, uh, and uh, a curriculum specialist for special services, and Carl, Carla uh, Cock, uh, supervisor of the post-secondary programs, a lot of a lot of terms in here. Getting getting warmed up to be as good as Lynn is reading a lot of these minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, sketch out the, the purpose of the program and how it complements other MPS and Midland County ESA programs. He also delineated all such low incident special services programs K through 12. Uh, the third topic was uh, the change to the nine week grading period. Gary Verlindy and, and Kathy Ellison then discussed uh, the district study of moving to a standard nine week grading period at all grade levels. Uh, the standardization would be easier for parents to track, and with the success of web-based uh, home access center, access center uh, parents can already get a daily a picture of the student's academic progress. Uh, administration is going to continue discussions with teachers in February. Uh, last, uh, Central Middle School. Superintendent Ellinger shared some information on ramifications of closing Central Middle School and the various ways of transitioning the students. Uh, he discussed schools of choice, district or redistricting, and staff implications as well as master schedule uh, considerations. Our next CAST meeting is February 27th, and the copies of the meeting minutes are in the hallway. Thank you. Dr. Ellison, anything to add to that? That was a pretty full agenda. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Lynn. I have to say that Lori Hendrick, the teacher there, and her staff are just incredible. We, we have incredible staff everywhere, but you could just feel she just exudes her love for her students and she said how much she loves her job and it is just so obvious uh, when you walk into those classrooms and uh, you know even just interfacing with the students and I know we all see and meet these students when we're out out in public so I just wanted to to just um, give Lori that extra and her staff that extra little pat on the back thank you and uh, that's, the, you know, it's with CAS, it used to be Special Education and Services, uh, was the former acronym, but I think for the, that, I think that's where most of us broke in at some point in our career. And it, uh, you really want to get down into the meat of things and look at what's going on in the classroom. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a very interesting but very enjoyable uh, community to uh, sit on. So uh, if you haven't, maybe in future years you have the opportunity to do so. With that, uh, we move on to finance with uh, Mr. Oley, and we have a, a, a re yep. committee report. Let me give you a brief update on our meeting of uh, last week, and we obviously already talked about much of that. And I wish to say when we went to FVO meetings that Gary and Linda would exude how much they love their job every day. I don't know, maybe I just, maybe I just missed that sentiment. You, you came late. I, I came late. I missed that part. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> cool. That's mean they're not equally dedicated and passionate about what they do. Um, Mr. Ellinger updated the FFL committee on our recent interest in the Mills Elementary building and property. And the committee also began discussing the long-term plans for that particular site and feels that for now, minimal heating and maintenance of the building is a worthy idea to protect the district's interest. Uh, Mr. Belindi shared the details of a future district survey of needs for wireless technology. And such a survey will identify future equipment needed to implement this aspect of the district's technology plan and all associated costs. And then for the remaining hour and 55 minutes of our two-hour meeting, the committee discussed the next property <laughs> management plan, uh, which obviously was a discussion we've just completed here at the, at the board level. And uh, we had a great discussion here. And, and the, the minutes say that the committee requested time for review of the options for addressing the potential closure of Central Middle School during each of the next two school years. And I think, as you can see, they did a great job, a very comprehensive plan in presenting this to us tonight. So um, that was really the, the meeting, and, and it was. I mean, it was all about the property management plan. 
And um, I think all that discussion has been very worthwhile and very valuable to all of us, and I appreciate all the time they've spent for, for many weeks and, and months, quite frankly, to get to the point where we were tonight. So that was it. Thank you. And on to Mrs. Klein for our uh, finance report. Yes, sir. Favorite part, the gifts. $12,656 this week. Our first gift is a collective gift that was made by friends, current and former board members of uh, Mrs. Lee Rouse. And they have made a donation to the Midland High Cross Country team, knowing that that is something that was near and dear <coughs> to the, the Rouse family. And that was in honor of her years of service on the board. Our next gift was from the Dow High Music parents to support instruments and supplies in that program. East Lawn PTO donated money for books in the East Lawn Media Center. The Dow High School Athletic Booster Club donated toward the cost of a pool touch pad. And that's for the pool at Dow High School. Dow Chemical Company Foundation made a donation for Plymouth recess equipment. And also at Plymouth, Mr. and Mrs. Paul White, who've expressed that they've been very happy with the experiences of their, their children over the years, uh, made a donation that Plymouth is going to be using for recess rainy day games. So between the two, there's outdoor equipment and indoor equipment. I think Plymouth has recess pretty well covered. <laughs> uh, Seabird School and then the Midland Rotary Foundation have paired up to provide resources for an anti-bullying program that Seabird has researched and will be using, and it will involve not only their students, but their staff and, and their broader community as well. So these uh, are all the donations that we've received in the last couple of weeks since our last meeting, and we're constantly grateful to the support that our, our families and our communities show our schools. Absolutely. It's amazing every time. It's simply amazing. So with that, uh, any other questions of Mrs. Klein on finance? If not, uh, we'll leave her alone for the evening. I think she's done very well. Um, we will uh, hear from board members at this time. And then uh, as a reminder before, at the end of this, we will move our, uh, I will take a motion to move to closed session with the anticipation that we'll come out of that closed session and have an actionable item potentially uh, at the end of that process. Ken, you're changing the agenda is all, and we didn't take action at the beginning of the meeting to change. This, I don't think, will be a very long closed session. Okay. Um, okay. Certainly do hearing from board members. Oh, I'm sorry. To take yep, our our uh, my oversight on my part. So w we're going to move to the closed session now with the intent that it will be a very short meeting um, and that we will be back in open session very quickly. So. Um, I, I mean, I move. I move to. I move to change the agenda so the study session is yeah. before the closed session. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Sorry. We'll take a vote. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion with support to move to closed session and changing. Or I'm sorry, changing the agenda to close a closed session, uh, and uh, resume to open session after that uh, with the same kind of motion. So, with those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those same sign. We'll take a two-minute break because the president probably no. needs it. No, we just <laughs> then we just move to do the board right. member comments and then yeah. go to closed session. Right. Oh, yeah. it is. So we, have to <laughs> <laughs> we had to change the agenda. The agenda wasn't correct. It's been a long day. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, we'll start with to my left with Dr. Kaminsky with that. I just want to start off by saying thanks to the the resources and leadership that the directors and Mr. Ellinger provided with bringing me as a board member through some of the difficult uh, decisions in, uh, in thinking through the property plan and all the information that goes along with it, thinking through those next few years. Um, thank you, Mr. Poole and your staff uh, for all the wonderful work you've done. I know you've invested a lot of time. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, you know, overall, um, as a district, I think we can move forward and uh, be healthier um, as we go forward. Uh, the, the only other item I'd like to mention is just the uh, this the support and the turnout for the 21st century learning uh, forum that was hosted on a very cold night a night before break and to have approximately 140 50 community members turn out for that that it was just amazing to see how indicated having the uh, the 21st century learning is I think there's a lot of concerns about what 
are our kids going to do in the future? Uh, things have changed. There were some references in the 21st century learning about industrial revolution, how education has changed along with that. And I think that same kind of grand scale as far as uh, some of uh, history's greatest periods is, uh, is giving impetus to changing education and um, kind of how we deliver it, um, what's it for, and so forth. And I think that there was uh, uh, some great comments uh, from those that attended that. And uh, it, it also goes to show how nice it is to go to the community to get the support. Um, we cannot move that forward uh, without having the community helping out with that. It's just amazing to see uh, the businesses, the community, um, and, and other education entities helping us out with that. So that's all I have to say. Done. Well, I just would like to second Dr. Kaminsky's uh, gratitude toward the administration, Mr. Ellinger and the administration, for laying everything out like you did. As a newcomer, that was so helpful to me, not having been through this before. It was right in front of my face. So it was very, yeah. very helpful to me, and I thank you for that. I think you did an excellent job on that. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I was on that visit also to the um, classroom at the community center, and the word that comes to mind for me was delightful. It was just a whole delightful group of people. I thought we had a great time there. I also visited a first grade classroom that morning at Seabird, and I had the same delightful experience there. And the teacher was super busy, and but yet she took time to explain to me what she was doing and why and how it all fit together and what it all meant. And so that was a real nice experience for me also. Well, I, I'll start out with thanking um, Carl and, and all for uh, recognizing all of us for what we do. We do it because we, maybe this term is hard to use right tonight, um, enjoy what we do, but um, we do. We, we do it for the kids and for our community. And to make it even better, we got thank you notes from students at Plymouth telling us why they like us and from thank you for buying things for our school like desks and s pencils and you know do you like your job and and that's all I have to say it said so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that ultimately we do enjoy our job and and that says these little uh, thank you notes say it all um, I guess uh, to address the central middle school um, that is just one spectacular building. I think all of us absolutely love going into that building. So it's nice to know, as Carl says, we're not using it as a middle school, but it's still there and it is part of MPS and, and we will continue to love that school. And um, Steve and your um, staff over there, thank you for all you do for that school because it is very special. And um, even though, the students and the families will move on. I know that there will be lots of fond memories. There are generations of fond memories of Central Middle School. And I was able to attend Thursday night, uh, the 21st Century Learning, and it was, it was just exciting to be in that room. And I have to say, not only the, the panel was wonderful to hear, but the questions and the comments that the audience had, and it was just so, so neat to have them get up. Once that first person got up to that microphone, I don't know how many, maybe 10, 10 people spoke and, and uh, some similarities, but also some diverse thoughts. So it was just a very neat um, evening and thank you to everyone that participated in, and um, whether putting it on or, or commenting. And I think that is, that's it. We're ready to start second semester. So yes, we are. I'll pass it on. Mr. Oley. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback actually on several things that Lynn said, and I agree. I think the forum was outstanding last Thursday. And quite frankly, I didn't know what to expect. I'm one of their pretty high expectations stuff. I thought we'd have good turnout. I know we'd have good panelists and stuff, but I think maybe use the word to describe uh, what I was thinking. It was very rich. It was just very, very rich. And I think how everything was organized and how it was structured. Um, I think Kim Houston Philbeck did a wonderful job moderating it. We had excellent panelists. It was really nice of them to commit their time to prepare and come and participate of that. And I agree. I think the questions from the audience were outstanding. And I came away from it with saying, yep, um, acknowledgement that we have challenges ahead of us, that we've got to look differently at things in the future. But I think there was a great acknowledgement that says Minnesota Public Schools has been doing a good job. We have to continue to do that, perhaps in different ways. We have to take it to the next level. But I think there was kind of acknowledgement there. Everybody was there that says, yeah, you know what? Our kids have been really well prepared, and we all want to ensure that continues to happen in the future. So um, you guys did a wonderful job. Kathy did a wonderful job up there as well as representing Midland Public Schools and stuff. Um, secondly, I, I guess I just want to kind of say the same thing to, to Steve and, and Central. 
it's really hard. And maybe, you know, I actually have sympathy to Yvonne and actually Angela. My guest to have such an important decision so quickly into your tenure here. I don't think the rest of us had to, had to deal with that kind of challenge right away. It's always hard to, to close buildings because, you know, people always jump to conclusions about why you're closing what building, how do you make those decisions. You know, let it be known. Let it be known that there's no question that Central has outstanding students and outstanding staff and outstanding leadership and outstanding parents. And they've got perhaps a longer history, you know, than almost any other building in this district has. And if we go way back when, they were the first high school, weren't they, if I recall? Mm -hmm. Way back when, second. maybe before Steve's time, I'm not sure. Um, second. But second. <laughs> so a wonderful history and legacy in, in Central Middle School there. And um, I know we'll have more time to talk about this over the next year and so, but. Um, really important to what this district stands for is what's taking place and the number of thousands of kids that have been educated and the wonderful faculty we've had for many, many years over there. So I just don't need to say that because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a jewel of Inland Public Schools. So um, anyways, enough said about that. And lastly, I, I think you're right, and I want to thank you, Carl, for I, I forgot to thank you, you know, last time for the nice letter to the editor you put in, kind of thanking all of us and recognizing that we appreciate that very much. And I think this is a community, I think, we'll all attest is that that does appreciate, you know, and even tonight we had you know, Mr. Jaster and other people have acknowledged that they realize we have tough jobs, and I think our community recognizes that, they do. And I think you were wrong about one thing, that we don't get paid, and, and Lynn already said it. This is our payment. I mean, this, this is our payment right here. So on the front of this one, it says, what is the longest word in the alphabet? E-L-F-A-B-A-T. What's the longest <laughs> word in the alphabet? <laughs> Smiles, because it has the word mile in it. I, I, I just got to read this, so I just... Dear Mr. Oley, thank you for making, this is from Plymouth, which we are very appreciative that kids from Plymouth took the time to do this. Thank you for making this school for me. It's perfect for me. And thank you for making the best library. You make a perfect gym, too. <laughs> Plymouth Public School is more better than my preschool. <laughs> you make a very good playground. Have a good life. <laughs> Your friend Sammy. <laughs> be better. That's pay right there. That's pay. Very rich pay. So, thanks. Jerry. Um, Maybe beating the same things, but a little different angle. Thanks to Steve and his entire staff, not just for for understanding your parents and your students, their needs, and what would work and what would not work as we went forward. That that helps immensely. Uh, we're not playing blind man's bluff of what the kids need and what the parents want because we have people who are very in tune and very integrated into their into their school. That leads me to my second point. I said the word school, not building. Just like when we shut down, quote unquote, the elementary schools, a, a real school is staff, parents, and students. It's not the bricks, it's not the mortar. And yeah, there may be tons of legacy and there may be a beautiful auditorium, but it's not about the building, it's about the kids, the parents, and the students. And what we saw at the elementary schools is it's the same kids, it's the same parents, it's the same staff, and it's gonna work, and we'll make it work and I look forward to uh, everybody doing that. Um, the 21st Century Forum was great. It shows uh, to a large degree uh, our community at work, the wealth of resources we have. And I don't mean wealth of money resources, but wealth of talent resources, insights, uh, global reach of people. Um, that's gonna always keep us at the forefront and force us as a board to be at the forefront of what's gonna be needed in the future. And uh, just seeing that manifest itself in that forum was, was outstanding. And then uh, lastly, in the property plan, um, it's interesting. We have closed 35% of our buildings, or will have closed 35% of our buildings in, in a three-year period. And that's amazing. I mean, that, that's a shocking number, and they shock everybody when they think about it that way. Um, What's incredible is most of that 35% went very seamlessly. And I look very forward to the last of that 35% going very seamlessly also. It's a testament to our staff. Gary, your comments during the thing of, of staff having time to do this well is more important than doing it fast. We said that during the elementary. We're saying it again. It's better to do it well than it is to do it fast. So um, I'm looking forward to the folks really uh, welcoming kids into their new environments, welcoming parents into their new environments. And uh, in two years, everybody wondering why we were all upset and concerned. So that's my comments. Angie. All right, I'm going to start with the central thing. And although I am new, I was on the school closing committee, so I feel like the central thing has been out there for me for quite a long time. I'm, I'm glad we took the additional two weeks. It really helped me because it was very tough for me. I actually volunteer at Central. This is my second year. 
um, in there. And so I, I know those kids, and I know what a special place it is. But um, I think like you had said, I kind of resolved that when I was on the school closing committee because I was representing an elementary school. And I, I did have to step back and say, you know what, the school really is the kids and the parents. And at that point, I said, if my elementary school closes, I know that I'm going to still be with these same kids and these same parents. And there wasn't a building in the district elementary school-wise that I would have cared if my children went to. So they, they all, when I would visit them, are, are fabulous places. And I must say I feel that way about Jefferson and Northeast. I don't feel that these central kids are going to a school that won't be a fabulous school for them to attend moving forward. Um, so that's all I have to say on that. And then I actually do want to send a little shout out to um, my son's teachers this week. Um, my son actually missed all last week of school because he was ill. And as you would know, last week was not the week to miss <laughs> um, when you have <laughs> five tests in five classes and I just want to say how fabulous they have all been in working with us so that he can um, take there's just some fabulous things he went on Moodle one of his tests was put on in Moodle he took it yesterday I mean we just have some you know the teachers were just fabulous working with us so that he could get through all this so I just thought they deserve some accolades for that thank you um, everybody says it so well but I do have a a couple of things. First of all, Mrs. Conrad, in her comments this evening, made a very great point uh, about what children can and can get can and can't get into after they're out of school on any given day. Um, that's always a concern of mine. Uh, I've had that discussion with Ms. Mr. Ellinger at uh, various times about what we uh, we as a district can do. Um, we can't be everything to everybody. Uh, but we'll certainly, as um, Mr. Washman has indicated earlier, that, you know, look at some options that potentially could be on the table uh, sometime in the future, depending on what that, how that breaks down. And there's a lot to look at and with, even with that consideration. So um, so just wanted to say that um, uh, the 21st century, Carl, Carl and I uh, had the luxury of having dinner with, and it wasn't a luxury, it was a, a good time to, to have dinner with our panelists and our moderator the evening of the 21st century event and uh, he asked he posed a question to me about whether or not this was meeting uh, what I envisioned as a uh, my expectation of that event uh, me personally and uh, I just want to say that I left that auditorium that night uh, extremely excited about the future of this district and um, I think it's been uh, it was said that evening and it was been repeated thanks to Roger and the Middle and Daily News on how well we educate our children in this district. Now, how we choose to change that in moving forward uh, is exciting. Uh, with the 20, with the, uh, New Tech High School and a number of other things that potentially are out there for us, um, and a New Tech High School program, I should say. Um, there's there's a lot of things that we have uh, an opportunity to look at, and uh, we certainly gained some valuable insight from the community and from our panelists with respect to how we need to prepare our students in the uh, going forward in the future and so it was very enlightening and certainly exceeded my expectations and I wanted to thank Carl I actually called him last week and he was on his way down to support Dow High's uh, opportunity in Grand, Grand Rapids with their uh, our, our band and um, I want to repeat that publicly that uh, Carl was well done uh, I think the community received it well to those and the staff and the agenda group that helped participate in that uh, it was extremely well done, and, and I, uh, I personally appreciate it. So, um, last, uh, I'd like to um, give a shout out to um, all of our students who just went through a very tough exam week. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that my uh, youngest is very pleased to know that she's taken her last high school exams. So, uh, with that, uh, if nothing, if there's nothing else, we'll uh, move into our uh, close session here shortly. So. Want me to make a few comments yeah. here? Mm -hmm. You can. Uh, first thing, and I want to say this, I'm glad that, that our central staff stuck around. Um, even in the midst of making this decision to close that building that you all made this evening, I do worry that we'll lose one thing. And um, I, I will admit up front, I could be wrong about this, but I don't really think that I am. 
And that is from my very first year here when I started looking at some academic achievement data and I looked at the demographics of each building and what makes each building unique, including Central. I have to share with you that I was astounded at the academic achievement that the staff um, achieved with our Central students. When you look at those MEEP scores and how those students do, um, given the demographics of that building, and that's a generalization, and I don't mean anything negative by that, but there's a high percentage of uh, title students in that building. And to see that staff not just be effective with the kids, but take ownership for that and take a sense of pride in how they support them. I don't know how many school buildings there are left in the country or in this state anymore that you can identify with that unique of an identity the way that they did with their students in the program that you offered. So that's as sincere appreciation as I can express for the years that you have done and as they well educated me when I met with that staff, the 26 years worth of discussion that Central Middle School may close at some point in time. Just think of the burden of that that they carried for a quarter century and it didn't diminish their dedication to the kids and what they accomplished with them. I just think that's incredible. And I don't think there are that many programs that could really say that about themselves anymore. So I just wanted to publicly acknowledge that. And then to get on w with the uh, recognition of kids, because this is one of the things that makes me so um, uh, proud of being part of this school district. Just for example, Adams Elementary. The 2011 a Adams Cards or Us sale was a huge success. Students sold a total of 2,474 cards that earned a total of $618. You know, it wasn't the dollar amount that got my attention. It was the fact that they sold over almost 2,500 cards that really says something about those kids and the culture in that building. Related, at Midland High, over $2,100 by the Student Council donated for Adopt-A-Family program to purchase Christmas gifts for families. Still at Midland High, over 500 toys to the Salvation Army U.S. Marine Corps Toys for Tots program. Um, used sweaters to Mr. Rogers Sweater Drive, sponsored by CMU. Used books for the Books for Boots program to, ven to benefit VA hospitals. Pennies for turkeys. I don't even know if you want to know about this one. <laughs> <laughs> but they raised over $300 uh, in coins to buy holiday meals for families. Key Club students rang Salvation Army bells at area businesses and others baked cookies and delivered them to some of the senior housing facilities in the community. And the welding class, this is the last one at Midland High, assembled 20 bikes for the Bikes for Tykes program. <laughs> Doesn't that say just make a wonderful statement about our, our, our kids and what their interest is in service learning that we know is becoming more and more important these days. Um, Midland High's marketing students raised um, over $1,100 for the American Cancer Society. Uh, Dow High, tremendous support shown to make a wish in Team Mary projects sponsored by the marketing and the advanced marketing students. They presented checks in early January to make a wish for more than $3,200 and Team Mary for more than $1,600. Almost $5,000 in checks for what everybody in this community would say would be a very good cause. And then last and certainly not least, the uh, Dow High BPA Club had an exceptional performance at the 2012 Regional Leadership Conference on January the 7th. 13 out of 17 students qualified for the State Leadership Conference in Grand Rapids. That speaks to the caliber of youngster, youngsters that do all the service learning that we uh, have provided for us in this community. And the very last but not least thing is the performance of the Dow High Symphonic Band that I saw down at the DeVos Center on Friday afternoon. Strong support of this community. Every car that I pass, not that I drive that fast, <laughs> um, you know, had a Dow High sticker in it. There were a lot of people that went down as um, part of a travel uh, caravan, for lack of a better word. And... This, the kids, I mean, I looked around the room and there were actually parents that had tears running down their cheeks from watching that symphonic band perform. And what I don't think people realize is it was at the Michigan Music Festival and there are very few bands statewide that get invited to perform there. I think, I was told, uh, that this is the first time in the history of our music program that we had a band participate there. So that's really an incredible uh, thing. We need to recognize that at the board level. And I think inviting um, Steve, uh, Steve DeReese here Great. and some other students will be high on our uh, agenda if we can make the schedules work. Because we shouldn't let this go by without um, 
really recognizing what a great accomplishment and what an honor and privilege it really was to attend. And they did all of us well with their performance there. Amy. Thank you. Yep. And, and Mr. Ole is waiting for my next mess up on the agenda. This <laughs> at all, not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm counting on Billy to do an a, a edit of the tape so that we can uh, take care of these issues. Today. Move to go to closed session. Yeah. Move to go to closed session. We need a motion. So moved. Part. Okay, before we do so, we have to do a roll call vote. Yes, you do. Madam Secretary. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> yes. Paul. Yes. Vice President Wasserman. Yes. Secretary Baker, yes. Treasurer Ole. Yes. Member Branstad? Yes. Member Gorton? Yes. Member Kaminsky? Yes. We will move. Close take five session. minutes take and five. move closed session. Uh, we are back in open session, so I will turn the floor to Mr. Verlindi. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that the district and the Midland uh, Federation of Paraprofessionals have reached an agreement. It has been ratified by their membership, and we bring it to you tonight as a recommendation. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, point out that we have the MFP president, um, Paula Young Anderson here, and we also have Lorraine Hawkins from the negotiating team. And then uh, next to them is Cynthia Finney, uh, chief spokesperson for the district and uh, wow. um, her first successful contract. <laughs> All right, very good. Anyway, highlights um, of this are um, um, the contract expired and we went without a contract all last year, so far this year, and we have now an agreement that covers last year, all of this year, and next year. And for each of those three years, there'll be a 0% wage increase uh, for paraprofessionals. Okay, we do have a small number of paraprofessionals who are full-time and benefited. In those cases, they will contribute, uh, make a health contribution uh, to our self-funding of uh, health insurance for employees that is consistent with uh, some of our other groups, and that is a percent of gross wages, uh, depending upon the insurance coverage. It would be 0.75% uh, for single coverage, 1.5% for two-person coverage, and 2% uh, percent for full family for benefited employees. Uh, also some changes in the deductibles that's consistent with what we've uh, done with um, other uh, uh, employees. Change in co-pays, uh, the deductible for in-network coverage, uh, 200 max um, for an individual and 400 for a family. Uh, changes in prescription co-pays, uh, $4 for generic and 15 for prescription, and the 130% uh, of Medicare covered cost um, as opposed to the reasonable and customary standard uh, that has been used in the past. Also some language changes regarding layoff recall and assignment, and I think uh, both sides agree that one of the key elements of this is six hours of professional development. Um, paid uh, time for, for professional development for all <coughs> paraprofessionals starting next year on a yearly basis and the planning of that will be a joint task of the MSP <coughs> and the district to do the planning on that. We will collaborate on that. So um, with that in mind, um, I uh, administration recommends to you that the board um, accept and approve uh, this contract with Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals. Move approval. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by <coughs> Wasserman. Uh, questions or discussion? If not, okay. I'll call the vote. What do we vote? You ready? <laughs> no, no, if anybody has questions, or I mean, please, please ask Mr. Rolinger now, or we'll call the vote. All those in favor of the motion on the table signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. We have a contract, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thank very you. much. I would, just, I would just like to point out that I think the MFP, uh, even though it's been a year and a half, um, the negotiating has never been acrimonious. Everybody has treated each other with dignity and respect, and it was a very positive yet slow 
progress towards this ratification, but uh, Jason Harper was a key element in this as well. He's not here tonight, but uh, I just applaud the MFP. And, and Gary, I didn't comment before the vote <laughs> because what I want to say needed the vote first. Thank you. Um, really, really appreciate the, the, the spirit of how this was done and look forward to going forward. That was, that was excellent and really do really appreciate it. And, and you should know that, that some of our comments are going to be after this way now and I'll just, you know, obviously speak for myself. We wish we do more. We wish times were different where we could do more, but that is not a reflection of how much we value everything you do. And uh, I, I made the comment earlier that I think um, you're just probably undervalued. I think the people that work with you on a daily basis know how critical you are and how important you are to the education of our kids and stuff. And we wish we could kind of broadcast this louder to our community, quite frankly, because what you do is essential um, to our kids. And I just want to thank you for that. Yes. And you are um, really vital members of our team here. So I just wanted to please pass it on to all of your colleagues yeah. and stuff. And thank you. John. I also want to say just thank you for your patience and understanding in these very difficult times. And I uh, um, also wanted to echo what Mr. Oley says is that we, we see you in the buildings all the time and your, your role is very critical. And uh, mm -hmm. we really appreciate all that you do. Anything else for the room? Well, thank you again. And I, late. You know, yeah, I, thanks for your patience <laughs> tonight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You, you drew a very long meeting, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we do appreciate you. and. Uh, I think sometimes uh, quietly behind the scenes as you work, you don't feel as appreciated as you probably should. Um, we really do appreciate, we understand what you do for us. It's, it's critically important to everyone that sits at this table and all the parents and students that you impact in this district. And it's, um, you know, and it's, I think you do it for uh, as much as we do it up here is for the love of, of experiencing and in, in, in working with young people. So we appreciate you and thank you again. Yeah. With that, Anything else for the good of the order? We stand adjourned at 928. And I should have taken a motion, but.